Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show with accomplished chess players, authors, personalities, and adult improvers where they discuss their lives, their careers, and share tips about how to improve at chess. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. So without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone. We have a great conversation with WGM Tatar Rabrahamian coming your way. One thing I forgot to mention in the intro is that we do not discuss the ongoing World Chess Championship in our interview. This was recorded in advance. And of course, on Perpetual Chess, we strive to have evergreen content. So we discuss a wide variety of chess related topics. It's a fascinating interview. But if you want up to the minute coverage of the World Championship, then check out our bonus content as well as the many excellent features on on YouTube and elsewhere. So without further ado, let's get to our interview with Tatyov. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We are joined this week by a returning guest, an uh, old longtime friend of Perpetual Chess, one of the strongest female players in the U.S. She is Armenian by birth. She emigrated to Southern California as a teen, which you can hear all about in episode 49. She spent years as, a, of course, professional chess player and trainer, but she's recently moved to Kansas City, Missouri, to work with a chess startup called Bright Labs. Uh, Levon Aronian is a spokesman for the company, her fellow Armenian turned uh, American, of course, and she's been working on designing a curriculum for them. Uh, she recently competed in the U.S. Women's Championship as, as the uh, World Cup, and we'll be discussing all of these events. But first, let's welcome her back to the show. Uh, Tatyav Abrahamian, how are you, Tatyav? Oh, thanks for the welcome. I'm doing well. How are you? Uh, pretty good. I mean, as I mentioned before, we're recording. My, my kids wore me out, but I'm going to try to buck up for this interview and uh, find my energy and you'll you'll be doing the heavy lifting anyway. So uh, uh, should be good to go, but I'm ready to dive into some chess. So Tatya, the, the first topic that I had in, in mind for us to discuss um, is something that came up recently on Twitter. Uh, Grandmaster Johan Sebastian Christensen, pretty well-known uh, Norwegian player. He often, he works as the second as uh, Jordan von Forrest, who of course had that amazing result in Wyk and Z last year. Um, mm -hmm. But he tweeted something that I felt like really resonated with a lot of people and top players in particular. Um, and I saw you respond to him. So you're on the hook for discussing it. So first, let me uh, share what he tweeted, which was uh, recently, he said, uh, this was on October 30th, 2021. I've worked so hard every single day for many, many years to reach the 2600 plus level. And to see my rating drop from 2620 to 2560 in the last three months, it's so heartbreaking and brutal that I'm lost for words. I've never felt such emptiness and disappointment in my entire life. Um, and he, there have been updates since then. Glad to report he said he's felt a little bit better. But Tatya, have you had a heartfelt response to that where you said it's so rare to see vulner such vulnerability and honesty from a member of our community, even though most can relate to this completely. All the best as you work through your feelings and continue to persevere. And I know that uh, Grandmaster Christensen subsequently said he got a lot of messages like that. I certainly, you know, being nowhere near his level, but just, you know, someone who's competed in chess could empathize. And I think a lot of people felt that way. But how did it land with you when you saw that? I was really touched by your reply, Tatya. Oh. Uh, well, I mean, it's like something you can just feel in your bones because it's just so relatable and chess is just so personal and can be so absolutely heartbreaking that, you know, you just try your hardest and try to do your best and you, like not even in your career, you play like a six hour game and then you make some stupid mistake and you lose and it's just so heartbreaking and there's really no one who can share your I mean, okay, other chess players can share your pain with you, but it's just all on you, and you're the one who has to work through it. And, um, I mean, the reason I said what I said is because I think, like, a lot of well-meaning people, um, like, try, you know, when you feel, you see someone in pain, your reaction is to try to, like, comfort them. So a lot of people are like, oh, you'll bounce back, and you'll recover. It's just a setback. It's normal. It happens to everyone. And that's true. But I think when you're sharing your pain and you're being so vulnerable, I think you should be allowed to like feel your feelings and not have them like dismissed or immediately just be like, oh, everything's going to work out. So I think if he was willing to be so vulnerable, then we should give him the space to do that. Yeah, it, it was a touching reply. And I, I certainly find myself in the category that you're describing. It's similar if someone suffers a loss, you know, in life, a, a close one passes away um, or something like that. Often it's like you want to, 
express sympathy, Mm -hmm. but you just don't know what to say. Now, obviously, a chest lump is not on that level, but um, but as you say, uh, you really do feel it. It really feels intensely personal. And again, I'm not uh, I'm not a player like at at your level or at Johan's level. So I can't imagine when you put even more work into it and feel like people are watching and rooting for you. Like, I just can't imagine. So it was nice to see that. And I am happy to report that um, this will this episode, we're recording a couple weeks in advance, but a few days before, or rather, this will be released uh, a few weeks from when we're recording. But a couple days before we recorded, he's just about uh, starting the um, European team championship. And he tweeted, I want to thank everyone who commented on my post and sent me messages. I read all of them. It was a big surprise to see such big support from many different people from so many countries, both chess players and non-chess players. Thank you. Um, so it sounded like he was in a better mental space at least, but yeah, I just wanted to discuss that because I know, you know, there's a lot of, even for just casual players playing on the weekend, the the feeling of devastation can be uh, so so raw. Yeah, I mean, I don't even think you need to be a chess player to feel it. Like, if you think about it, like, I spent the whole year preparing for the bar exam and I failed. Like, that's that right. was, I mean, not me, but like someone who did, right? I mean, it's devastating, like, dedicating yourself to something and then you feel like you failed. And obviously, if you fail at the bar, everyone will be like, oh, you'll pass the next time. But, you know, that's the feeling of failure and the letdown is so real. And I know he mentioned he has some health issues, so obviously that's more um, more of a priority. So I hope uh, I hope that's really taken care of and he's on demand. Yeah, I I hope so as well. And just want to be clear, obviously, I, I also commend uh, Grandmaster Christensen for his his openness and you know it made me obviously. I mean, I I was familiar with him, and um, you know I'm not not predisposed to root against anyone, but I didn't have any sort of personal like uh stake in his results but now he's definitely like someone i'll be rooting for just because having seen that vulnerability and uh finding it so relatable um definitely be tracking him and hoping that he can uh pull himself up um although as you say i mean with the exception of uh ali reza who says that chess is good for mental health um, <laughs> no okay no when you says chess is good for mental health i think it's more in the lines with like if you play chess you won't get alzheimer's right and then if you play chess right. you will cure your depression of course like people <laughs> ran with it because it just sounds like something to right, kind of yeah like, you know, but i mean okay english is like his like second or third language so y- yeah, and we should say his English is quite good. And what we're referring to is Ali Reza Faruja, and we haven't talked about this on the podcast yet. Um, but he recently, after winning the candidates, uh, talked about how much he loved chess. And um, one of the things he said was that it's good for your mental health. And as Tatyev says, I think that what he meant was like, it can be good for your mental longevity. It's good for staying sharp. But as Tatyev said, at least at least online, it seemed like a lot of people were having some fun with that because they're like... Um, it's not good for my mental health the way that I g- get upset when I lose. But you know, when you're, when you're the uh, an amazing talent like Ali Reza, mm-hmm. uh, with a chance to be the youngest world champion in history, if he can win the candidates and then win against either Napomnici or, or Carlson in the next world championship, um, then then you could see why I said that. But yeah, mainly it was just uh, amusing. But um, but yeah, it's hopefully. You know, it's hard because you have these the down the the down moments are often greater than the up moments. So that overall can make uh, can make balance tough to find when you're competing. What what about you, Tatyov? I mean, obviously you've had great successes and I'm sure some disappointments. Do you do you has that been your experience? I mean, I, I can't think of any great successes. <laughs> no, I mean the downs in chess they're just so horrible. Like, you know, the high the thing is when um like you're doing well and you know you're um having good tournament after good tournament okay again like i don't remember what this is like anymore but like <laughs> it becomes like you're not you're normal and then you're like yeah i'm this strong and do you expect it but when you're doing poorly it's just um, it's just so heartbreaking it just hurts so much on so many different levels like emotionally and mentally it's just um such a terrible experience but I think that's like in any way, like when your life improves or you improve as a person or something, you know, you have this like slow improvements and then you kind of get used to them and they become the norm. So it's kind of hard to put things in perspective sometimes. Yeah. 
Well, I don't I think mean, Paulo Reza has a, bad, has a bad tournament. He's not going to say, oh, I'm this amazing player and like I've broken a record and he's just going to feel bad, right? Like he's not going to yeah. look at his career as a whole and be like, you know, like I'm just so great and like I'm so inspiring and, you know, my mental health is amazing because I played that. <laughs> it's <laughs> right. horrible. Yeah, I mean, he already said he doesn't think he has a chance to emerge from the upcoming candidates, which, um, <laughs> you know, he's he's like the only one who doesn't think he has a chance, as I, I think. But, uh, but yeah. But anyway, Tatyev, let's uh, thank you for um, for being willing to discuss that. I just felt like it was important because a lot of people probably find it relatable. But but let's tie it into your your own recent chess tournament. So. Um, mm-hmm. You know, most recently, your big event was the U.S. Women's Championship. Um, I, I know that you lost your first couple games and then made a strong finish, and I believe you finished tied for fourth. Um, mm-hmm. So how, how do you reflect on that tournament, Tatio? Uh, yeah, it was a very difficult tournament, and I knew it was going to be a difficult one. Um, I was actually considering dropping out of the tournament a few weeks before. It was just, um, like, my life was so chaotic. I had just... I hadn't just moved. To, okay, that was my second month living in K- Kansas City. But I had um, when I first got here, I was in at Air- Airbnb for like four or five weeks while I was looking for a place. I didn't want to rush with that, so I was just moving to my new place, and uh, I was like in the middle of it. I had like no furniture, and like I just had a mattress sleeping on the floor while waiting for my other stuff. And I had something else personally happened that was like really devastating, and. I was just thinking of not playing and it would be my first time actually missing the U S championship. So it was a dis- big decision for me and my work was very supportive for, of me. And um, I talked to my coach and he was like, it was kind of also kind of understanding what it was like, you know, as a U S championship, we can prepare and just have a tournament and like play a decent tournament. And the thing about the U.S. Championship, there's just so much around it. It's not like, you know, I go to a tournament and I just play it. There's just so much media and so much attention. If you're having a bad tournament, kind of can become a story. And you can't just bail on the tournament. You have to be there. And we had two days off this year and, like, opening, closing. So it's just, like, this really long event. And just beforehand, I wasn't even sure I could emotionally handle it. So that was that. <laughs> but eventually, I decided to go play. I was like, how can I miss it? And... Um, I also took a week off before to prepare. Um, but yeah, I mean, the tournament started just horrible for me. Like I lost the first game, which was like one of the most humiliating losses of my chess career. And the fact that this game is going to be in the database, my name forever attached to me is just so horrible to me. Was that the game against uh, Carissa Yip? No, no, it was game against Big Game. Big game. Okay. When I was just winning at some point, I have checkmate and then... I don't know how to describe it. It's just my brain just stopped working and my brain just turned off. I just couldn't, I just couldn't see anything and I ended up losing. It was, it was just really embarrassing. And yeah, the second game I lost to Carissa and then it was just um, like zero out of two. It's not what I'm used to. Usually, you know, I'm like fighting for top uh, prizes, but after zero out of two, I'm losing to Carissa, who's like a clearly a contender and young, up and coming, probably like, I mean, she was the strongest player in the tournament. So I obviously that like put all my hopes, any kind of hopes I could have had, even though realistically I didn't have any hopes. Uh, so yeah, that was really tough. So um, that night after the game, um, I talked to my coach Alejandro and then he, he was just like, you know, just go for a walk. And he gave me like a list of questions to think about, like, why do you still play chess? Like think about of your good events, think about like your bad events, like what went wrong, what went right. And so I just, I was just kind of reflecting back on my game. And then next morning he was just like, okay, we're taking a different approach. Like this tournament is a disaster. Like, uh, cause Carissa played some line. I mean, the way she plays chess, she just, you know, she just plays so freely and so confidently. So she just plays online. And then at some point, she kind of lost, um, lost the thread of the game a bit. But she was playing fast and she was playing confidently. And then she surprises me in the French, which is unpleasant to get surprised in my own opening. And I have no time, so I end up losing. Yeah, so then he was just like, you know, your repertoire just doesn't stand anymore. Like, you cannot rely on your past knowledge. You haven't been working. I mean, these are the things that are true, but are so unpleasant to hear. Yeah. 
Uh, so then he was like, you know, like I was playing on as a tan skin. It's like, you're going to play Night F3 today. And then it was like, you know, you're just going to have to listen and like trust everything I say. So I was like, fine, whatever. So we look at some structures. So I play the first time like ever in a tournament game, I play something that's not E4. Uh, so we play, um, we play this line. Uh, okay. So we play some kind of a game and, you know, a lot of things happen. Eventually I end up winning. Uh, so like one out of three. And then again, I kind of, um mentally back like fell back into bad habits because I was like, okay, I have one out of three. And then immediately I was like, okay. Hey, hey. Huh? Let me let me stop you for a sec, Tatya, because you're going through the whole tournament and I already have so many follow-ups. So. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> I mean I can so, stop after the because after the uh, fourth round we had a day up. So I can just say and then we can stop. Okay, let's hear the fourth thing. Yeah, no, I mean the thing is like again, like I had a one out of three, and then like I just couldn't let go of this first game, and I was like, if I was two out of three, I think I would have been tied for first. If one out of three, I was still middle of the pack, and I was like, oh, if I can manage to win a few games in a row, then like I'm recovering, and then immediately I lose my fourth round game, and again just like fallbacks, and like I just end like the first portion of like one out of four. Yeah, so, like, in last place after four four rounds. Yeah, frustrating, but you did have a strong finish. Now, bef before we carry it forward, as you say, at that point, you probably knew, okay, I'm probably not going to win the tournament this year. But with the questions that uh, Grandmaster Alejandro Ramirez gave you, your, your coach, to ask yourself, such as, uh, why do you still play chess? Uh, if you don't mind sharing, like, what did you come up with? Because, it, I mean, apropos of our earlier conversations, it is something that, like, when when we're down, we all we all wonder. Yeah. Um... I mean, it's like, uh, it's actually a good question because um, on like my day off again, like I went, uh, so I said after the fourth round, fourth round uh, I went for a walk because where the hotel is, there's a really nice park and a nice zoo. So I went to the zoo. I was like, okay, I'm going to go visit the penguins that always of course, really good. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I was actually listening to your podcast with Lawrence Trent and like he was also talking about it and like I also appreciated his honesty it's like you know when you play chess for a long time and sometimes you know you just do it out of habit and like you kind of lose your love for the game so I was also like thinking about I was like why do I like do I still love this game do I just play it because it's something I've been doing and for like forever and it's like why why am I doing any of this? But, and then I just started thinking of, I think like, so I, like I sent an email as a response and I think I said, cause, cause I had like, was thinking of the tournament and I think I was like, cause the highs just feel so good. Well, that's good. Yeah. That, <laughs> that's, that's something. <laughs> um, and were there any other sort of like insightful questions that Alejandro had given you that, that you mulled over in that um, moment of despair? No, I think he just gave me like four or five. Like I, I think it was just. I think part of it was to try to recreate, um, like good tournaments and what was like, like to reflect back on good tournaments and what went right and like try to recreate that and think about bad tournaments and what, um, like what went wrong in those bad tournaments. There was like many to choose from. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're too modest you're a very accomplished chess player but the problem is you're playing all these other monsters so excuse your perspective um, but um but could you say a little more Tatyav about um uh, what you describe about the media environment I mean obviously we all know that uh Christian Carilla and uh Yaz and Maurice are announcing and there's probably like some language in the contract to do interviews after the games mm -hmm. but um, but what else do you experience that makes it different from from a typical tournament when you're playing in the U.S. Championship in St. Louis? Uh, it's just a stressful tournament. It's more stressful. Okay, I think it's the Olympiad is more stressful. Maybe the World Cup is also very stressful. Um, but it's just, um, I mean, the title, of course, because I've been playing it for so many times and come so close to winning it and never managed. And um, like obviously a high price fund. And yeah, it's just like all the attention around it. And it's like probably the most special tournament of the year I play. And like there's another tournament where I show up and there's just so much attention to it and where I get treated as well. It's just everything makes it so much more stressful. And are you getting, a, obviously you have a lot of friends in the chess world. Are you getting a lot of like texts and messages from people that you don't necessarily hear from all the time during a, a tournament like that? 
Um, <laughs> when I was like zero out of two, one of my friends messaged me and it was like, this is why you took a full-time job. <laughs> that's, that's harsh. So every time I would have a blade game, it was like, just remember you have a job. <laughs> right. Which, and, and to be clear, chess gave you that job. So, you yeah, know, gotta, yeah, yeah. gotta give credit where it's due. Um, well, and so, okay, let's pick it up in, in round five. So you managed to pick yourself up and finish with a plus score. So what shifted for you, Tatyav? Um, yeah, so then I'm in the tournament at like three parts. So it was four, four rounds a day off, four rounds a day off, and then the last three rounds. Um, so and then we came up with this. So, I mean, we, all, we always had this rule. I mean, I've never followed it closely, but like I think a lot of people have this rule, like 10 minutes per move. Um, because like uh, time travel in this tournament is so prominent, and I think whoever manages their time well is like the person usually wins or at least does really well because it's just everyone gets in time travel. And it's just the time control somehow feels very, very fast. So I, what I, is the time I, control? It's 90. I mean, it's like, I think normal time control it just feels very fast. So it's like 40, 90 plus 30 seconds and then 30. Yeah. So then it does feel faster with the increment. Like, uh, you know, when we were younger, it was more common to have like 40 moves in two hours without an increment. But something about, uh, you know, at the weekend tournaments I've played recently, it tends to be 40, 80, which is even a tad faster, but even 40, 90. Yeah, it does. I mean, you get you get down under an hour very quickly and, and it, that it just feels like a, like an action game, you know, because it's easy to forget about the, the increment or the delay. Um, it was increment, right? Yeah, it's increment. But I also think I, I'm I don't know. I think FIDA tournaments are. 1400 and like 10 minutes doesn't i know doesn't sound like a lot but it is yeah especially as you say i mean you're not like in in peak form like you've been working you you know you've had stuff going on you've been moving so it's not like your openings are like razor sharp at the moment and that makes a big difference yeah 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 just time the time just goes by so fast and like even with this 10 minutes uh, rule like you spend 10 minutes like like three moves you spend 10 minutes it's like half an hour and that's a lot like 40 yeah, minutes so you, a lot, hour and a half is not a lot. It's just so so fast. So 10 minute rule, you're saying never spend more than 10 minutes on a move? Yeah. And I, I think a lot of coaches have this rule and this is just like a good recommendation, right? Like if you if you spend more than 10 minutes on a move, then like just make a decision because you're already going in the wrong direction. I mean, it's a very general rule. Obviously, sometimes you really have to dive deep into a position and like really think, but I think that's kind of a general rule. If you're over 10 minutes, you already make your decision because you're already going in a wrong, on a dark path. Yeah, makes sense. Well, I want to talk, there's a bunch of topics I want to get to, Tatyav. So before we move on from, from the U.S. Mm -hmm. Women's Championship, is, the, is there anything else you'd, you'd like to share? Any other like uh, big picture reflections about it? Yeah, actually, um, so we moved on. So actually, this rule turned in from 10 minutes to five minutes. It was like five minutes make a move. I mean, I broke this rule many times, but I did stick to it uh, more often than not. So I, I think that gave me a lot of confidence, like knowing that in five minutes I can make a decision and my decision is not like horrible. And um, so like, yeah, so then I made four draws and then like I just got my confidence back. And I think that was a big factor for me. I just play more confidently and... Um, like I won my um, rounds nine and 10. And then last round I was playing against Crush. And then, you know, I felt like that was kind of my test because it just historically been such a problematic opponent for me. And I was like, if I can, and I'm black against her in the last round and she's kind of has to beat me because she was competing for second place. And of course there's a big money difference between second and third or tying. So I think that was a comfortable, um, Caring for her, so I'm sure she was pleased by that. So I was like, okay, it's like I've managed to do this for the last, I don't know, seven something rounds or whatever, how many rounds. I was like, this is kind of my test. Like I have to try to do it. And then I actually managed to play quite quickly against her. And like, I don't think, I mean, we did get into some mutual time travel, but I don't think I was ever really behind on the clock or anything like that. So. Of course, beating her with black gave me a lot of confidence. And if this round happened, if this was like the first round and this is how my tournament started, obviously it would have taken a different course. So I actually think this tournament can be a really turning point of my chess career because I would just sit down and play some new opening and just be okay. And usually I just 
if I'm taken out of book quickly or my opponent surprises me, I just get flustered and all these things. But now, you know, like playing new things and just kind of looking over at something and looking, finding some idea and just going and playing, it just gave me so much confidence. That's great. Yeah. And as you mentioned before we were recording, we, before we started recording, mm-hmm. even though you're working nine to five now for Bright Labs, um, you you are hoping to play in uh, in Vegas in December, right? So mm-hmm. don't have to wait too long. Yeah, cool. I mean, uh, I have to prepare somehow. I have to like, get my life together <laughs> and start like, <laughs> finding time for chess. I actually have been listening to your Adult Improver series. I was like, I'm trying to get some inspiration for people who also have jobs and our responsibilities on how they fit chess into their schedule. Oh, thank you, Tatyav. I'm honored. Um, yeah, there's, there's, um, I mean, everyone has a different recipe. Do it. So, what do you think that you need to do for yourself? Uh, I mean, well, actually, right now I just have a lot going on because I'm still, I mean, I'm not 100% unpacked, actually. I'm still, like, trying to finish furnishing my apartment, and uh, I'm still trying to get into a 9-to-5 routine. I've been self-employed for so long. I'm so not used to just having a set schedule. Uh, I'm still teaching some lessons for our chess academy in L.A., the American Chess Academy, so I'm doing some online lessons there. I'm um, trying to figure out how to fit like fitness into my routine because yeah. it's my, such an important part of my life. And I'm also like now it's starting to really sink in that I live here because now it's feeling more permanent now that I actually have my place and it's like starting to feel like home. So I'm like, okay, I now have to start finding a community, start to make friends. So like that's kind of a priority for me. Like if someone invites me to hang out or do something, like I will... So yes, so that also takes yeah. time, like trying to create bonds with people. So I think um, there's just a lot going on. Yeah, I know you were a big fan of Southern Cali, and I got the feeling that there's strong, uh, strong. I mean, not the strongest in the world, but a relatively strong chess community and a strong Armenian community. Um, is there much of an Ar- Armenian community in uh, in Kansas City that you're aware of? Uh, I've met a few, a uh, few of them, but it's a bit scattered. I cannot compare it to Southern California. I mean, I lived down my building. Everyone in my building was Armenian. Um, I lived down the street from like an Armenian grocery store, Armenian bakery. I mean, okay, like I feel like all of Glendale is like up down <laughs> down the street right. from an Armenian bakery. So yeah, I mean that part has been very difficult. Not having um, access to all things Armenian. But I mean, there's there's a small community. They're a bit scattered, but I met a few a few of them and they have introduced me to others. I actually, I met um, a few of them through like Facebook and I met this woman and then we started talking and then she asked me, why are you moving? And I'm like, what are you doing? I said, I'm a chess player. And then she was like, oh, my uncle used to be Gary Kasparov's driver. Wow. And I was like, what are the chances? So she started yeah, that's telling me all the stories about like how her family worked for Gary Kasparov and then uh, they're in like Russia and like she's obviously in the US, but like her uncle and everyone, they eventually moved to Russia. And I was like, wow, it's world world. Yeah. And my Missouri geography is not amazing. So I... You know, I, as far as I know, it hasn't been reported where uh, Levon Aronian is going to be living. But, you know, some have guessed St. Louis. So I was I was checking to see how close you were to St. Louis. But it's it's four hours. Is that is, is my Google Maps right about that? It's like three and a half, three, three hours. Yeah. Minute. Yeah, I actually drove there for US Champs. It's not a bad drive. I mean, it's, it's not convenient for a weekend drive. But for like a, if you're going for a week, it's, it's not that far. Gotcha. All right. Well, Tatia, we got lots more to cover. I want to hear about uh, the World Cup next, but first we're going to take a break and hear from our sponsors. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by ChessMood.com. ChessMood was founded in 2018 by Grandmaster Avtik Gregorian. It's a chess education platform that gives you a structured path to work to improve your chess. For $29 a month, you get instant access to over 200 hours of Grandmaster prepared video content and includes openings, middle games, and end games. They also have an active online community where you can find training partners and fellow chess enthusiasts. Uh, Don't forget to check out their free content. They have a great blog 
where their grandmasters share uh, their own thoughts on chess improvement. I get it delivered to my inbox. So to learn more about uh, Chess Mood and what they offer, be sure to check out their website, chessmood.com. And we are back. And Tatya, we actually already interviewed your opponent from the World Cup, uh, Grandmaster Anna Muzicic. Um, But maybe you could give a better perspective about uh, what, what that trip was like for you and how your chess was. Yeah, actually, I listened to that uh, interview. I was, I was curious. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think um, like Sochi was great. It's like as a city, it's um, I mean, it's a resort city. So we weren't by the water. So I thought it wasn't going to be great. So apparently we were like very close to where the last time I played in the world. I guess it was called the world championship. I don't remember it at all. But um, like, you know, we had this like view of the amazing Caucasus Mountains. The food was just great and everything was like super affordable. Uh, I actually really like this format, playing someone around my strength in the first round. Um, I think it's better than just playing like a 20. Obviously, it's better than playing like a 2500. So the first round was very successful for me. My opponent's quite young, so I'm un- inexperienced. She really surprised me with her prep, but then... Kind of lost the threat. I won the first game. I managed to win the first, second game. And then I got paired against Anna Muzuchuk. So uh, that was going to be a difficult pairing for me, obviously. And um, uh, yeah, first round, like she talked about, like she was pressing most of the game. And actually, like the second round, we're playing on stage with like Magnus and Fabi. And I was like so stressed out and so wow. nervous. And I was like, I don't want to be playing. <laughs> I don't want these people looking at my games. And like sometimes I would see like Magnus like like walks around and I was just like looking at a game. And I was like, oh my God, can you go away? <laughs> so I can like play action, actually make a move. Because at some point she like captures something and I have to recapture. It's like my only move. And then Magnus is staying there. And like, I just cannot make myself move. I was like, please, please leave. <laughs> so I can, can recapture this piece and not lose time on my clock. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and actually that was the round, the first round when the whole Fabi thing happened when his opponent was, uh, his test came back positive. That was a very strange experience. And yeah, I mean, that was a really big missed opportunity for me in game one and game, game two is just my thing. Like, obviously it's tough to play for a win. Um, and I, I just, um, what did I, like, I just really misplayed the opening and I was just worse and it was just a very one-sided match from that point of view. Yeah, I mean, it's tough going against one of the, the top woman players in the world. Um, I think she I mean, finished top four, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and she and she qualified for the women's candidates, which um, I believe we're mm-hmm. up to seven of the eight qualifiers now: Alexandra Goryachkina, Kanero Humpy, uh, Katarina Lagno, uh, Alexandra Kostyanuk, uh, Tan Zhang Yi, Anna Muzichuk, and uh, Tingji Li. Um, and there will be one spot given to uh, the highest rated. So there is a wild card for the for the women's candidates. Um, so. By rating, of course, Goryachkina will, will be the favorite. I know you've um, played and encountered a lot of these women, Tatyev. How, what do you think about uh, who is likely to prevail in that match to determine uh, who plays for the World Championship, that tournament, rather? Um, I mean, well, first, I, I, I'm glad that they changed the format because before it was just so disorganized. It was just such an afterthought. They would have like two world championship in one year, one knockout, one match. And I remember once I was asked to write an article. So I was just trying to like research about this format. And I was like, oh my God, none of this makes sense because it's just you have two world championships and they're completely disconnected from each other because like the world champion doesn't get really any perks. And it, was, it was just so chaotic. So I'm glad they finally came up with, I mean, okay, they copied the system of the world championship, but that's fine. So I'm glad they came up with some kind of a more coherent system. Um, um, I, I Obviously, I would say Karyachkin is the favorite, but I, I think I'll be rooting for Kastinyuk. She's just such a fighter and she's just, um, I, I think she's very inspiring. So I think it'd be cool to see her win. But I think Karyachkin yeah. is a clear favorite. Yeah, and she's really maintaining her level, Kostinyuk. It's impressive. Yeah, she dropped her rating quite a bit, and then she had, like, series of tournaments. She won the World Cup. I mean, this is, like, her second time winning this tournament. When she won it, it was called the World Championship, but it was the same exact format. Right. She's actually won this twice, which is really remarkable. And then she won it without any tie breaks. And then 
was it before or after she had another it was like the european something she had another good tournament she's just been like on a roll yeah and then the last spot we'll go to the highest rated player so uh from what i can see it likely will be maria muzichuk although i don't know how much that can change but um but yeah i mean goryachkina it was interesting to see her play in the uh the open section of the the Grand Swiss, and you know she's got, as you say, a significant rating edge uh, with her rating over twenty six hundred. Um, do you, I saw? I tried to look if you'd played her. It looked like you've only played her in Title Tuesday. Is that right? Uh, I haven't played her over the board. I don't know about Title Tuesday. According to my database, you have. I don't even know. You know who who knows if it was her name. It might have been like uh. How, how did you know, it you drew. I, it was I don't, kind of a weird perpetual, right? Uh, I don't remember that much, but uh, I know. Um, I think it was from this year. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, but anyway, I mean, do you, do you have a sense? I mean, have you like played through her games? Do you have a sense of like how what her potential is? I mean, it'll be interesting to to watch. And obviously, if she's able to win the candidates, um, to to try to win the the women's world championship. Uh, I haven't, uh, I've looked at a couple of her games um, because she played some games in the Nimzo line that I played. So I saw a couple of her games there. And I saw her game against Matilyov in the Russian, um, was it the Russian highest league? Yeah. The Russian championship, yeah, she... I don't know what they call it. Yeah, that game was very impressive. I mean, she just seems like a, like a strong 2600, 25, what is she, like 2550 level player. I mean, I don't know what... I mean, she's still quite young, right? She's like 20? I think she might be 22. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like that she's playing in like open tournaments. I think that will be very good for her chess because... um, I don't know. I think it's like a double-edged sword. They have all these tournaments for women and obviously they're financially uh, quite helpful. But then it's just this 10, 15 players who just constantly play against each other. And I don't think that's very beneficial in the long term. I mean, I understand why it happens. I'm not saying I'm not being critical of it, but um, I think it also has a big downside to it. Yeah. I mean, even in the open events, you know, people complain about that. I mean, it can be, it can be, you know, you see the same people play over and over again. And then as you say, with in the women's events, it's a smaller pool of players. So I think it's even more exaggerated. Yeah, I mean, it's a small player, but like, you know, if you think of like top 10 in the world, like Magnus and stuff, it's like they're the highest rated, right? There's like no one better than them. So they're constantly playing each other and you're like, okay, this is like tiring, but they are the best. But then there's so many 25, 50 um, plus players in the world. So this is like very limiting to just play the same ones over and over. We are going to take a break and hear from our sponsors, and then we will get right back to our conversation with WGM Tatyav Abrahamian. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by our old friends at Chessable.com. Hopefully you know by now about their proprietary move trainer technology that helps you remember tactical patterns as well as opening sequences. Whatever aspect of your game you're looking to work on, there is an excellent chance that Chessable has something for you to help. They're also constantly releasing new courses. In the pipeline currently, they've got a lifetime repertoire 1E4 from none other than Anish Giri. And they've got the Ginger GM, Simon Williams, soon to release a treatment of legendary Grandmaster Alexei Shiraz Fire on board, plus so much more. So just be sure to always go to chessable.com and take a look at what's new. Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by aimchess.com. Hopefully by now you guys are all aware of their awesome algorithm that gives you actionable tips to improve your game. But on this ad, we wanted to make sure you're aware of the Magnus Nepo Prediction Challenge. Go to magnusnepo.com, sponsored by Aim Chess, and it's they basically ask you a bunch of questions to make predictions based on uh, what you think will happen in the upcoming World Championship. And there's lots of prizes like chess boards signed by Magnus, chessable courses, premium membership to Chess24 and Aim Chess, et cetera, et cetera. So fun opportunity. You can even have groups with your friends. So be sure to go to magnusnepo.com before the much-awaited world championship begins. 
And we are back. And the internet got spotty there for a second. But Tatya, if you were talking about sort of the the unique challenges of uh, the top woman chess players playing each other over and over again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, my point was that because, um, you know, like these tournaments for women, they're also very important tournaments like Grand Prix and World Cup. And they take up so much of the calendar. So uh, a lot of the players just end up playing each other, whereas there's such a big pool of players, 2,500 plus or 2,550 plus, that I think would be beneficial uh, to, you know, be more exposed to these kind of players or even playing 2,600s a lot. So that's why I was uh, happy to see Karyach, you know, be doing more of this. Yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I know Judith's always a big proponent mm -hmm. of playing uh, open sections. And of course, you mentioned uh, Carissa Yip, who won the U.S. Women's Championship at the age of 18. Very impressive performance. Um, do you think that she has the potential to to reach the level where she could be in the women's candidates? I mean, she's about 2,400 feet a already. Uh, I, I mean, she's a very talented player, and I think she has a very good attitude. She's very confident, and she bounces back very well. Uh, like, she lost this game in the U.S. Championships very badly, and then she won, like, four or five in a row. And when she was playing in the Cairns Cup, she lost, like, her first four games, and she managed to bounce back. So that shows really good character. That shows good nerves. I'm sure um, she was devastated after losing. Okay, like, she, of course she was. Who, who wouldn't be losing four games, especially in this high-level tournament with all this media around it, right? Being covered and everything, but she managed to bounce back. So, um, so I think that, like, shows um, good character and also she just plays quite confidently. Uh, so I think, I, I mean, she's just, again, like, at a very um, tricky age. She's graduating from high school next year, next spring. So if she chooses to pursue chess, I think that she will be very successful. But uh, I don't know. I don't know which direction her career will go. If she will choose to go to school and go to um, some Ivy League school, like so many of our top level girls have done, like um, Jennifer, Annie, and Emily, they've all gone to Ivy League schools and none of them played this year because of that. So I think that's going to be a major factor in her career. Yeah, so you don't you don't you're not sure if she's planning on going to university uh, next year. I mean, I know she's applying, but I don't know where she will eventually end up. I don't. I mean, okay, who can know? I don't think she knows either. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. And Tatya, thank you for your perspective on the women's candidates. Uh, last I have heard, they have not yet revealed the date and location. Again, the final competitor will be named soon. And then as with the men's candidates, they have not. That's all we know for now. And of course, um, they'll probably get to planning that more after the um, World Men's World Championship, which of course will be ongoing mm -hmm. um, as this episode comes out. Now... Uh, Tati, have another topic I wanted to talk about was your actual chess startup, your actual company. Um, so I believe your title is director of chess there. What's your day-to-day -day life like <laughs> at Bright Labs? And perhaps you could share a little bit about uh, what the company is doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I started in, uh, so I started after the World Cup. So after coming from World Cup, uh, I had like I took a quick, quick trip to Armenia for a couple of days, for like four days, and then it was time to come home to LA and pack and move to Kansas City. Um, so our startup, uh, uh, I work for Bright Labs, and you know we're making uh, this um, actually physical chessboard called um, the name of it is Chess Up. So it uh, has AI in it that allows you to either play against an AI. You also can use um, AI assistance and different level of assistance, both for your opponent and yourself. You can play uh, another person over the board. You can, we'll, we will have uh, integration with Bleachess and chess.com. So you can also play others online. And it's a smart board, which um, helps you, uh, when, especially when you're playing someone at a different level. Like when you touch a piece, the, all the legal moves light up according to strengths in different colors. So it gives you hints, but you know it's still on you to figure out what move do you want to play. Uh, so when I first moved, um, my first uh, so we we're doing these interviews with our backers. So that's what I was doing. So I got to talk to a lot of people, uh, like who were backing this project because of Kickstarter. 
Uh, it was actually really interesting because I heard from a lot of people that who have a connection to chess in a way that's very unusual for me. Uh, like I would ask people, do you play online? And most of them said no, which was uh, kind of shocking to me because I thought everyone plays chess online. But a lot of people are like, no, I don't like playing online. I just, you know, I like the playing over the board and which is something I relate to because I also like to play over the board. I like to study on a physical board. And a lot of people said they don't have anyone, like they kind of lost, uh, stopped playing chess because they didn't have anyone to play with. And um, I guess at some point that was also, excuse me, a big issue before internet age. So it was really interesting to talk to our backers to understand like um, why they decided to back this project, what they're in, why it's, like why they like chess, why they wanted to back this project, and then after that, now I'm just um, I mean there's other things that come up here and there, but my main thing is just putting this curriculum together. So I just um, kind of so I um, I mean this is something that I really care about, you know, and I do something I want to do it right and I want to do it well. So I spend a lot of time, think, time thinking about how to make it so when uh, our users, um, like a lot of them express that they want to improve at chess. And I feel like a lot of people do want to improve at chess, but they don't know how. There is so much information out there, which is great, but it's also overwhelming because, you know, you go on YouTube and you look something up. And if it's not for your level, then it's just frustrating because you just don't understand and you just feel like, you know, it just makes you feel bad. And um, like I talked to some of our backers and then they would tell me like the books that they're reading. And I was like, oh, like in my mind, I was like, oh my God, you should not be reading that. They'd be like, oh, I'm reading Dvoretsky's and Game Manual. And I'm like, no, yeah. you should not be reading this book. So I think a lot of people, they just, um, they know there's information out there, but they don't know how to access it, how to do it right for their level. So um you know, I also have some experience in teaching, so I've been really thinking about how to do it so that, um, like, everyone, regardless of their level, has something for them. So, and also based on the conversation with our backers and, like, how they would want things to be done. Um, so, like, the lessons will be through the app, so everyone who uh, buys a board or, like, has backed uh, the project or can still pre-order it will have access to it. And... Um, so I just eventually decided to have a lot of levels and the levels will go up by like 200 point increments. I mean, like for my own reference, like I've broken down by USF. Um, yeah. Uh, USF ratings. I, I just want like everyone, uh, if you don't know how to play chess, if you go to like the first curriculum, you learn everything you need to know how to play chess. And then from then on, like all the rules, like you just learn how to play the game. And then from then on, I've just been thinking about like, why like chess is just so such an overwhelming game for so many people even when people learn how to play and it's just kind of like okay i know how the pieces move but like what's next how do i actually make sense out of this game and kind of make the game more um like start building up on that make um, the game more approachable more um accessible to everyone and and then as i'm moving on like having things for like different levels, like 16, 1800. So I've been uh, going through a lot of tournament games. Um, there's, you can make amazing amount of puzzles out of like so many games, you know, high level games, low level games. It's just, when you play through a game, like when a game ends in a draw, it's some pawn end game and you just go make a few moves and then you see there was like some, something super instructive or some blunder at some point and then so i've been creating i've been working on creating like a puzzles database I'm actually after i listened to Anna was a chicken interview with you i just went through her games i just have an engine on and i'm just playing through her games i started making puzzles out of her games nice. i have so many like checkmates and like tactics just based on her games and then I chose like another player and I did the same thing. So I'm like trying to create a database. I think by now I have like, I've broken them down into categories. I think now I have like around 900 of those. Um, it's, it sounds kind of fun for that to be like your day job, <laughs> just like design materials all day. Uh, yeah. So like I've been, yeah, just like thinking and like, it just um, takes me a while to just come up with comprehensive things and um 
I have like thinking about what le- le- what kind of lessons is- each level will have, and now, I mean, what I'm doing right now it's still a little broad. Like I have like um, all these databases with like tactics, and then next I have to like start putting them in categories and thinking about like what's appropriate for what level. And um, actually, I saw this like suggestion on Twitter. I don't even remember who posted it, and they said. Um, like when you're getting to like 2200 or 2000 level, like there are books that come, they give you like practical examples, right? To play out. And then it was like, how come, like, does anyone know of any book that offers this for lower rated players? And I was like, oh, that's actually a good idea. So this is something that I want to do, just have like this section of some positions that for the users to just play it out and practice. Cause, Cause sometimes, you know, you're solving a puzzle and like the puzzle ends with like you win a piece and I'm like, okay, but for, if you're like 900, 800 rated, like meaning winning a piece is usually kind of meaningless, right? You're not going to convert hundred percent of the time. So those are the things that you need to practice. And yeah, there are like day-to-day things that come up and like, I have to, you know, like discussing how this will you look um, for the users, how to make it user-friendly and like how the app is going to look kind of things that I never thought about in my life um, to actually to consider it, to discuss it, which is really interesting to work on something from ground up and just build something and hopefully something for people to enjoy. And uh, like, again, like I'm, this is, you know, an important uh, task for me. I've taken up this project, which is a very large project. Um, so I'm just trying to make it um, like accessible for people. Sounds great. Yeah. And the Kickstarter I read, this might even be an old number, but it was funded with like $19.9 million or something. Like just uh, an no, insane level. No, I think 1.9. <laughs> like 19.9. Oh, that, <laughs> like that's a lot of money. That makes more sense. 1.9. My, yeah. <laughs> my apologies. Um, and so it sounds like, so it's it's basically a chess startup. So you're going to the office every day and uh, the other um you know, early stage employees are there with you each day? Yeah, yeah, there's six of us in the office. We have six time, uh, six full-time employees. Um, I mean, they're all very nice people and it's, it's nice to work in a small company and, uh, you know, like there's a lot of communication and like we have these meetings. I mean, it's very unusual for me because like I haven't done this and I like this kind of full-time job before. Uh, as I mentioned, yeah. I was self-employed. I wasn't just non-employed for all my whole life. Have you had non-chess jobs, Tatiev? I don't know if this came up in our other interview. I don't think it did. Have I done what? Have you done jobs that, like outside of chess? Have you worked at a restaurant? or I mean, I know, yeah, I know yeah, you I went to done. university for a while. Yeah, yeah, I have done some other jobs. I think there was a okay. point in my life I was just kind of going through motions of life and I just didn't know what my relationship with chess was going to be. So I've had some other jobs, but not like a nine-to-five full-time job. Gotcha. And with the curriculum... So I understand you're finding tons of material and finding finding ways to present it to a broad range of, of chess levels. Um, and, you know, I've seen a couple of the videos um, for Startup, the mm-hmm. primary product of, of Bright Lab. So it's like a um, it's like a computer. I mean, it's like a I'm <laughs> struggling with the words, this being an audio only podcast but it's like a physical chess set mm-hmm. obviously where it lights up and tells you where the pieces move so with the materials that you're designing Tatya how is that um, going to be like how are people supposed to consume it do they set up the positions on the board or is it something that they read or watch videos or how does it work I mean it's going to be interactive lessons uh, so there's going to be connected to an app and it, uh, it's also going to be connected to the board so, um, I mean, it will be both using, I mean, okay. some of it will be just app only. Some of it will be both. Okay. And I is mean, it I, still I do want to focus. Backers? Sorry, go ahead. Is it still taking backers? Uh, you can pre-order it, but the Kickstarter has ended. So you can uh, okay. pre-order it on the website. Gotcha. And then I didn't mean to cut you off. Were you, were you going to say something else? I, I mean, I, I do want to make use of the board because, you know, I did grow up studying on a board and I, I do like every time I'm solving puzzles like I always set them up when I'm reviewing openings on a computer I feel like it does nothing for me I just click remove and then like sometimes I'm just like what did I just look at so I just really enjoy like studying on a board so I think it's just um, 
such a big benefit to have a board while you're studying chess. And I think it's just a better way of learning. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of some, that seems to be the consensus of people that I interview, even though some people seem okay with the, uh, the di digital only lifestyle. Yeah. Maybe, maybe this new generation, but like, I don't know. Um, or maybe they just play also, they play more online. But I, I think like when I was playing in all this, like uh, online tournaments, like online Olympiad and uh, what else did we play? Okay. Like this, um, what was this? The, not the grand, Prix, the, women's speed chess championship or like before those rounds, like I would go on my computer and because I was playing or like even us women's championship when we played online last year, <clears throat> like I would uh, do like a couple of puzzle rushes or something just to get my brain working and used to like solving chess on a computer. But when I'm playing go over the board tournament, like I, I um, like to review my openings on the board. And I also, also like to, uh, like do a puzzle, like solve a puzzle before the game. So like my brain starts to work and like I get used to like thinking about chess, like on a physical board. Yeah, I think especially, yeah, before tournaments, I think it, it can't hurt to uh, to do that. And um, I, I also, when I talk to a lot of people, they would tell me like, well, I don't have anyone to play with. I want to play with like my girlfriend or like my boyfriend, like my partner or like my kids. But like, um, they don't know how to play. Like I know how to play. They don't know how to play. So they don't want to play me because they know I'm, you know, they're going to lose, but I want to teach them. I don't know how to teach them. So it kind of, it's a way for them to like bridge this gap because like, if you're giving the other person assistance, you know, then they're getting some help, like they're getting computer assistance. I mean, they still have to make their own decisions, but at least you're bridging this gap. And like, it's a way for you to, uh, you know, like spend time with um, like your partner or your kids and, you know, like some, and then you don't have to be on your board, on your phone if you're playing on a physical board and, you know, you can like enjoy the game and like actually try to teach someone who feels like completely intimidated by chess. Sounds good. And what's the uh, ETA for the product being available? I'm sure it's a fluid thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's uh, some delays as there is with everything. Um, but uh, like everything is just being delayed. So yeah, February. Okay. And, and of course, Levon Aronian is the uh, brand ambassador. Um, uh, how did that come about? If you're able to say, or are aware of how it did? Yeah. Our founder, uh, he went, he got, um, like they were all like, uh, all the four founders of the company. Oh, okay. Like who, who were at the beginning of the company, they all work for Garmin and they were all in product, um, uh, this, um, product design. So, I mean, like, not product design, um, uh, product development. Uh, so like they kind of, they've, uh, dev like they worked on developing a few products. So they felt like, you know, they knew how to do it. So the founder, like he, uh, went to MIT and he got a business degree and it, there was like a special program for people who already know, um, who already like have a career and like, they're trying to get like an MBA. So like through Armenian connections, <laughs> I was talking to a friend and he was like, oh, I'm like trying, trying to start this company. And then of course it was like, oh, I know Levon Aronian. And that's how they connected to Levon. And that's how they connected to our chess academy. You know, got this email that was forwarded to me. So, and, uh, you know, this one email led me to me moving to Kansas city. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it sounds, sounds pretty interesting, a whole different world than, than what you've been living, uh, in your time in the U S. Yeah, yeah, it's very different. But I mean, the city is starting to grow on me. I think I was very resistant to liking the city. When I first moved here, I was just determined that I was not going to like it. But it's starting to grow on me. It's a, it's a small, compact city, but it has this neighborhoods and has some art scene. And I don't know, just like little pockets with little things going on. And then I'm starting to realize that places like LA and New York are more of the exception and more yeah. cities are like Kansas City and like places like LA are like very unique and very special. So I'm like, okay, this is like, I cannot um, just compare everything to how things are in LA. Like this, this is like more how most people live. Yeah. I don't have a lot of experience with Kansas City directly, but the Midwest generally, I mean, people are, are very nice. Like there's, uh, there's a, 
more pure than LA, I would say, <laughs> even though, of course, LA has a lot going for it, obviously. But yeah, I mean, okay, obviously, there's some shallowness with people in LA in some level. But um, yeah, I mean, I actually met quite a few people who have moved to Kansas City who are not like native Kansas City. And I don't know, they're na not native to Kansas City. So a lot of people have moved here. And uh, I, I, like, I think there are reasons people are coming here. There are some headquarters here, so I think the job market is quite good. So I, I think, and then the fact that a lot of some people have moved here, that I think they're also open to other people and making friends. Excellent. Well, I'm sure you'll be fine. I'm uh, would love to to chat in another couple of years and hear all about <laughs> Bright Labs' continued success and uh, your having become the the mayor of uh, Kansas City. The mayor of Kansas um, City. <laughs> but before we let you go, Tatia, we have uh, two Patreon mailbag questions that I'd like to uh, ask you, which I did send to you in advance, full disclosure. Um, so first, since we were discussing, you were discussing sort of the challenges of designing a curriculum for players of a different level. So the first one is kind of along those lines. So this one is from Richard Davidson. So thank you for the support, Richard. Um, and Richard asks um, a specific sort of chess evaluation type question. So I'm going to dig into it. He says, when there are several candidate moves to consider, we're told to calculate several moves ahead for each candidate. But to choose which candidate move to make, we have to decide which resulting position is better. Material differences are easy enough to value, but what other factors should go into a position evaluation? Do you come up with a numerical evaluation like the computer does, or could you suggest a checklist to use when evaluating a position? Well, I mean, first I would say this is like a really good thing to do because I, I think a lot of people don't do this work. They just, um, I, I think like it's very tempting to calculate, a, like if you successfully calculate a long line, I think like you're like, oh, I calculated this line and you just play it. So I think it's a very good thing to do to, uh, like evaluate the positions and compare them to each other. So obviously your main thing is you don't want to end up in a worse position than where you started. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, so the numerical, the piece value is of course there. Um, so, but then after that, again, you have to, I mean, it's kind of hard to say like generally, of course, it depends on the position, but you won't, you know, then um, like look at the position where you started what were the problems, what were the good things about your position. And um, sometimes the few candidate moves you calculate, maybe they, the difference is just a matter of preference and you just have to make a decision. Uh, but then, you know, you like maybe you want to consider some things, like you don't want to um, end up with like bad pieces. You don't want to completely ruin it. <laughs> like it's one of these lines completely ruined my pawn structure. And also consider like what kind of position are you striving for? And like, are you striving for a more dynamic position? Are you trying to kind of calm the position down? Um, like maybe if you start in like a slightly worse position, maybe you're looking for dynamics. Like does this one give me a better chances? Does it complicate things? Or like maybe if you're calculating several winning lines and then you're like, they both look winning, but one of them looks like very complex and the other one is a little bit calmer and maybe, you know, that's the one you need because when you're winning, you don't want complications. You want to kind of want to keep things calm. Um, so, yeah, I would say like compare um, like the, um, the direction you're taking the position, like are you changing the nature of the position and like the value of the relative value of the pieces are you like ruining your pieces are you making them improving them like the exchanges that you're making and uh, maybe your are king safety and structure i mean it's all like very general things but uh yeah um i mean to me king safety i mean i don't know richard's uh rating level his his chess experience level so a lot of it depends on that, but uh, based on based on the nature of his his question, I'm gonna guess he's um, under under fifteen hundred USCF, mm -hmm. I would say for sure, and and maybe lower than that. Um, and I definitely I think king safety is a big one. I mean, what I tell my students um, of of that level, Tatia, or, or have told them is that like king safety is right. And correct me if you disagree with any of this, but to me, king safety and material are kind of like at the top of the totem pole in terms of evaluating a position and below that you have things like the the mobility of the pieces and pawn structure and stuff like that um i 
certainly don't think in a numerical valuation, or at least I didn't used to, although if you use an engine enough, you kind of start to now, or at least start to guess, but it's not like natural for anyone who came up in like a non-engine way. Mm -hmm. And um, more experienced players don't generally use checklists, but like you say, Tatyav, I think it's a good idea if you're struggling with like how to evaluate a position to start out systematic. Yeah. Um, I mean, like chess has changed so much and these things have become so relative and engines have changed chess so much. I was like, I was listening to this interview with Kasim Jan, well, not infamous interview with Kasim Jan of, yeah. Yeah. And that was like so interesting, like to hear like his views on like the engines and uh, how they have changed like the top level chess. So, yeah, let me just hop in and explain. Uh, Grandmaster Rustam Kazumjanov, who I interviewed on Perpetual Chess, a uh, great interview coming off of the first half of the candidates that was canceled in 2020. Um, and he, of course, was uh, Grandmaster Fabiano Caruana's trainer. And the interview that Tatyav's um, referring to, he recently did an interview with, I believe it was Chess Base, where he said that he and uh, he and Fabiano are no longer working together uh, COVID kind of put a stress on their working relationship. Um, just so, just wanted to give that context for an, any listeners who d- who didn't catch that. But no, no, but no. Yeah. You had this other interview, this interview in Russian. You know where like it was all oh, over. Right, yeah. Bobby is not okay. I don't want to finish the sentence, but that interview. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, you might as well, because again, this this caused a, um, a brouhaha, you could say. And uh, I mean, so basically he said that he didn't think that Fabi was as talented as uh, some of the other top players. Um, I'm paraphrasing, but I think that was the gist of it. Is that your recollection, Tatya? Well, I mean, I, this, the interview was in Russian, so I was actually... I mean, this was a great interview, by the way. So if anyone is a Russian speaker, I would like definitely recommend it. It was so fascinating to listen to this interview, and there's like so many interesting points, like different uh, um, subjects they talked about. Uh, I mean, the way they came to this point, and this is me translating too, so if something gets lost in translation, it's not on me. Um, hmm. Like... Levitov, who was interviewing him, he was asking uh, him about Fabi, like who is Fa- like he was just like curious about Fabiano, and then he was like the interviewer just at some point says like I feel like um, like Fa- basically like says like I feel like Fabiano should become a world champion. It's only right, like it's just. And then like Kazim Jano is like why like he may or he may not. And then he was like, well, I just feel like. Uh, like a player of his caliber, it's just like should become a world champion. It's like the right thing to happen. And then Kazim Jana was like, um, well, I don't know. There's like other players who are like more talented than him. Then he just says like, um, I mean, he does say complimentary things about Fabi. He just says like, um, like his calculation is amazing. When he's in good form, he's just impossible to compete against him. But obviously, yeah, when you just take that segment and then <laughs> share it on social media, obviously it uh, becomes... Yeah, popular. people kind of ran ran with that as an insult. And I don't necessarily take it that way because, like, what, what Fabi has achieved is kind of, um, it's, you know, it's un- indisputable what he's achieved. Right. So if you say he's not as talented as other people, in a sense, it might be a compliment because you might be saying he worked harder, you know? So... I didn't feel like it was like, oh, shots fired, you know, that that Fabi's not as talented. But I can understand why people would say that, because what I saw a lot of people online on Twitter saying was they were kind of like ridiculing the notion that Fabi could not be talented because, I mean, he's he's been number two in the world. He played for the world championship. Right. Like whatever talent is, he has to have it. But anyway, I mean, I I. I my Russian, I took Russian in college, but it's terrible now. So I can't, I can't watch the interview anyway. So, um, I don't, I don't want to opine too much on, uh, you know, secondhand, uh, interpretations. Yeah. I also am not going to defend what was said. I mean, okay. Fabian is also my friend. So I don't like anything, you know, negative said about him. So like, I'm not going to defend what he said. I think that was like completely unnecessary to say, but his point was like, um, like he's like, um, basically saying like you know, the way he calculates and the way he just solves position is just amazing. And like, that's where his strength is not just like this natural talent or whatever he was trying to imply. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it, I always do find Kashim Janov compelling, even though, um, you know, I, I, 
I don't know. I would have to see it verbatim to see <laughs> whether I agree and no one should care if I agree anyway. Um, but I mean, this has been an interesting sideline, but getting back to Richard's question, Richard, I, I, in summation, I, I just have to say, um, this is obviously, I, I love doing this audio only podcast, but this is one where you might be better served asking someone on Twitch or something. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any resources I can think of that that give good advice for how to evaluate a position. I'm putting you on the spot here, Tatio, but can can you think of anything? How to evaluate? Well, I mean, there is like the check point, like, you know, like uh, piece, um uh, oh my god! Um, like Agard's thing. Um, like material. That's the word I'm looking for. Like material, yeah. king safety, right? Like structure pieces. Like you can go through a checklist like that. But I think, um, like again, like things are relative, right? Like if you destroy your pawn structure, but you're checkmating your opponent, like who cares that you destroyed your pawn structure? So yeah, um, like tactics take precedence in chess like this like if you like that's that's how chess has changed right like you can you can take an engine and just make almost everything playable now and the reason we ended up on that inner is because we're talking about computer evaluation and the reason i would say it's interesting is because when kasim jana was talking about um just like computer preparation and um like if you think about how you can prepare, he was just basically saying like everyone has the same access, everyone has like same openings, right? Because they have the same computers. And then it says you're looking at the line and then the first four moves, they give you zero. And then like the last move says like plus 0.5. So you're not, obviously you're not going to look at it. And then it's like, but they actually, if you look at it and you keep digging deeper, you can actually make this line workable to playable too. You just have to like put in this work. And um, and then he, that's like he was basically saying like whoever does this work it like gives them um, uh, like extra oh my god why can't I come up with words like an edge like, like an you, edge yeah you do the, yeah because then you can surprise your opponent and you know they haven't looked at it and you're playing this line that maybe computer gives like an s a slight edge or but then through enough work you can like it changes its mind and like another thing he said that was like super interesting that says. Um, I think he was referring to like uh, 2016 candidates when he was saying like we had this term in our lexicon that uh, computers don't understand the position or like you can, you know, like look at a position, computer gives an evaluation and now you're just like oh, and the computer doesn't understand it. It's wrong. And he's like, no, that just doesn't exist. Like to prove a computer yeah. wrong, you need another computer <laughs> to prove this computer mm -hmm. wrong. So you cannot like throw this uh, words around anymore. Obviously, this applies to like the top players. Like for us, um, it's a little bit different because we just make so many mistakes, but they just play such pure chess most um, a lot of the times, like such concrete, and they barely make any mistakes. Yeah, that's why. Again, I mean, the world championship will already be going by the time this comes out, but I can't wait to see what directions the uh, the openings go uh, after these guys have been in the lab with, you know five grandmasters each and the best engines in the world for, for six months or whatever it is. Um, so Tatia, we just have one more mm -hmm. Patreon question with you. It's with uh, our, our, our best, uh, best question submitter of, of recent Alex Friedman, shout out to Alex. Um, and he asks, he says, uh, according to his database, your score against Grandmaster Alexander Shabalov is three and a half out of four, which according to my database as well. And in three of those games, you had the black pieces. What are your recollections from these games? And do you see the fear in Alex's eyes when you're playing him? <laughs> uh, actually, uh, the score is three and a half, one and a half. I have lost to him. I guess it didn't make the database, but it was in some, some win over where he played Queen G4 early on. It was a very complex game and I ended up losing. Uh, and I wasn't black in all of the games. One of the games uh, was a Sicilian. That actually, that's the game that I really enjoyed because it was some kind of a Sicilian. But then it went into an end game, and uh, like for me, for a Sicilian to go to in an end game, like I can lose the thread of the game. But I thought that was a very high quality game, and like I'm actually quite proud of that game. And like uh, Shabal is obviously a very strong player, but he also has a kind of style that I think allows him to lose more games gives room, you know, for lower rated players to beat him. So I don't know. Yeah, very don't aggressive. Here. Yeah. And do you what do you consider your best wins, Tatyev? 
<laughs> my three wins against Chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. I played him recently and it did not go well. <laughs> um, nice guy, though, of course. My best win. So obviously this last round game against Crush, I think, um, just psychologically, it was just such an important win for me. Um, one of my favorite, absolute favorite wins was 2010 Olympiad in the last round because we still had hopes of meddling. Actually, we tied for third. We just lost. We didn't win a medal on tie breaks, but um, winning this game, like winning for your team is just such a good feeling. So we ended up beating India. We tied for third. We didn't get a medal, but that was just such a such an amazing feeling. Uh, winning my games in the World Cup and actually qualifying to the second round, that was a great feeling. Um, what else? Oh my god, that's that's yeah. plenty. That's yeah. That's I, mean, great. <laughs> I mean, if you ask me why my worst losses, there's be like way more. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll save that for next time, Tatyov. It's been been great to catch up, and uh, yeah, wish wish you luck with uh with bright laps and uh, chess up. Um, is there anything you'd like to say before we uh, call it a night here, Tatyov? Yeah, actually, yes. Actually, we had a discount code for anyone who wants to pre-order. Oh, great! So Let's hear it. Yeah, discount code is perpetual, so you'll get ten percent off if you pre-order on Bright Labs. And yeah, I mean, I'm excited if someone does uh, pre-order, and if like um, I don't know, people have suggestions on. I uh, guess I never done a course from uh, you know from scratch. I'm like excited to do it. If like I don't get something right, you know, like to improve on it. And, you know, I'm hoping to make a product that people will enjoy and they can uh, improve their game and, you know, like stay entertained and improve their game. And this is something like I really care about. So I would, you know, I would like to hear some feedback. Excellent. Yeah. And the site is Bright Labs. That's spelled B-R-Y-G-H-T-L-A-B-S dot com. Um, we'll, of course, put the link in the, in the show description and uh and uh, yeah, you know what, Tatyav, I'm gonna go ahead and order one. I've, oh, I've, it, great. It, it looks it looks cool. So um, so thanks uh thanks for for coming on, and I hope we can uh, catch up again in a couple years um when you're again when you're the mayor of uh, Kansas City. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. Thanks for having me. Perpetual Chess is proud to be a member of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. Be sure to check out their sports and pop culture related podcasts as well. I also, as always, would like to thank Matthew Passy for producing the show. Without Matthew, Perpetual Chess would not exist. And I want to thank everyone who listens to the show, whether it be on your own without telling anyone about it, keeping it secret, or if you're helping to spread the word, all the better, whether it be telling a friend about a particularly impactful interview or whether it be writing a positive review online, all of that stuff helps get the word out and helps Perpetual Chess continue to grow. But most of all, of course, I want to thank those that provide financial support to Perpetual Chess. Without you all, Perpetual Chess would not be possible in its current form. And I would like to give uh, special thanks to the following people and entities. Here comes the list. Uh, Chessable.com. David Lazarus of Lazman Chess, coach of Dave's Young Tigers on Lee Chess, Quality Chess Books, The Capital City Chess Club, The Abysmal Depths of Chess Blog, Adaptive Interactive Web Designs and Services, The Apprentice Twitch Channel, Anidi Deer, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, The Charlotte Chess Center, The Chess Central's Chess Blog, ChessMood.com. Chris Flanagan, Chris Lott, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel He, Danny Davidson, David Mitchell, I am Dimitri Schneider, Douglas Wilson, I am Eric Rosen, Farhan Tharwar, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Glenn Downing, Greg Harfst, Greg Shahadi, Gregory Gullick, Hampus Axelson, James Kennedy, Jay Garrison, Jeff Martinson, Jeff Schaefer, Jeremy Nielsen, John Jernigan, John MacArthur, Kevin Forsyth, Kevin Gilmore, Kevin O'Callaghan, Kevin Pryor, King Cell, the King's Crusher YouTube channel, the law offices of Stuart Katz, Matthew Feeney, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Michael Sullivan, the famous Mr. Dodgy, the Nerd Nace Twitch channel, Perry McManus, GM Peter Prohaska, Peter Sodi, Philip Flemons, the Playmore Chess Academy of the Hamden Chess Club, Ray Lillywhite, Reuven Fisher, Rick Rivas, Robert Hansen, Ross Crossland, the Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stephen Kelty, Stephen Martinez, 
Sven Gearson, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of StrongChess.com, Todd Kennedy, The Vintage Patsers, which is a chess.com improver group, Wayne Beam. And I also would like to thank the following. Hashtag Chess Punks, who are the adult improvers on chess Twitter. Ace Vallega, Adam Fowler, Adam Johansson, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Al Hastings, Alan and Maggie Sue, Alex Pejas, Alexander Markovitz, Antonio Cancino, Antonio Leonfort, FM Andre Tarakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Angus McLeod, Barry Hessian, Bill Gruber, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Bill Trammell, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brandon Halseed, Brian Chase, Brian Mullis, Bruce Scott, Bruno Johnson, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Cameron Davis, Ken Kabadi, Chad Hilton, Chad Likens, of Rose City Chess in Portland, The Chess Dojo, Chess for Charity, Jacksonville, Chess Pats of Spain, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Kiefer, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Costa Carras, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Best, Dave Saylor, David Blaskacek, David Brown, David Gores, David Hamblin, David Cramley, David Peterson, Dennis Parrish, FM Donnie Ariel, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ed Mead, Edwin Rodriguez, Eric Baldwin, Ethan Smith, Evan Rosenberg, Ewan Richardson, Ian Mason, Felipe Mayo Perea, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Letard Lavoie, Frank Tortoris, MD, Frank Zananes, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Gautam Narula, Gene Stewart, George Foote, George Harris, Giovanni Russo, Gregory Higgins, Han Shoot, Harish Srinivasan, Howard Vihan, Jacob Kovac, Jason Apollo, Jason Murray, Jacques Pari, James Aspinwall, James Banastia, James Muir, Jason Woolham, Jay Tuttle, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeff Davis, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jesse DeCumos, Jesse McNulty, Jim Jones, Jim Ratliff, Jim Sadler, Joe DeSano, Joe Valdez, Joel Thomas Ramos, John McAdams, John Tolley, Juan Almaguar, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Bannister, Jonathan Slater, John Quist, John Tolley, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Justin Goodfellow, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, Grandmaster Josh Fridell, I am Kari Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Cook, Larry Reiferth, Lars Wiesen, Macaulay Peterson, Maria Emilyanova, aka Photo Chess, Mark Chaves, Mark Fitzpatrick, Mark Miller, Mark Wilkins, Marco Butolovich, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matt Ferrari, Matthew Coughlin, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Matthias Plock, Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Gobel, Nate Solon, Neil Bruce, Nigma Malajanov, Nicholas Isabel, Olaf Mueller Michaels, Pablo Davila, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passan, and Paul Bain. Paul Clarkson, Paul Eckert, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Queenside Management Limited in Switzerland, um, Randall Montgomery, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hallenbach, Richard McCormick, Richard Tucker, Robert Callahan, Robert Turner, Robert Wall, Robert Wilson, Rory Coleman, Ryan Berg, Samson Teaches Chess, Satyajit Malagu, the Say Chess YouTube channel and publishing empire, Scott McKinnon, Scott Rose, Sean Krauss, Sebastian Finsterwater, Sergey Makagon, Seth Ruzica, Seth Will, Sean Tracy, Silver Knights in Richmond, Simon Schmidt, Stefan Roller, St- Stephen Miller and Tom George, WGM Tatia of Abrahamian, Terry King, Thomas Brown, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, FM Timothy Wall, Tobiah Rex, Tom Edsel, Tommy Farron, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Beauchamp, William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, Zachary Hoskin, and Zhivkor Stoyanov. Thanks for listening, everyone.